Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth session of our seventh annual Turo University California Social Justice and Public Health Speaker Series hosted by the Public Health Program. My name is Gail Cummings and I am the Pro Program Director here at Turo University and I'm joined today by Deirdre Wilson, co-coordinator for the Social Justice Course in Public Health and moderator for today's session. The topic of this year's series focuses on mental well-being and the complex intersections between COVID-19, structural racism, and inequities in mental health through the public health lens. So to continue to examine and untangle the root causes, implications, opportunities, and solutions of these competing public health crises, we are hearing from and having conversations with leading experts in the field of public health and social justice. Today's session is part two and a continuation of, the, of our discussion on generational trauma and the mental health implications in Latinx and Asian Pacific Islander communities. We are thrilled that, to be joined um, by our guest today, Dr. Sergio Aguilar Gaxiola, founding director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities at UC Davis, and Nani Wilson and Luini Massina of the Asian American Recovery Services Health Right 360 Project here in San Francisco. Before we begin with today's session, even though we are all meeting virtually as we have been doing so in the last year, year and a half, we are all currently sitting on, standing on what is indigenous territory. With the permission of Karina Gold, Ohlone leader, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto University California sits on the traditional territory of the Karkin Ohlone who lovingly stewarded this land for generations. It's important to remember that the land acknowledgement itself does not exist in the past tense because colonization and land theft does continue. I'd now like to turn it over to Professor Deirdre Wilson, Chair of the Community Action for Health Concentration. Welcome again, and we thank you all for participating in this seventh annual Social Justice Speaker Series in this fourth session. I would like to remind our students that this is a course and that you are required to complete the, uh, the reviews uh, and uh, the assignments after the course. I'd also like to remind all of our participants that this is a, a session that will be recorded. We have a Zoom recording policy. Please review this policy and govern yourselves accordingly. Our roadmap for this evening will consist of an overview given by Dr. Aguilar Gajiola and also overviews given by Ms. Nani Wilson and Ms. Luini Messina. They'll provide these overviews of their perspectives of the, of the impact of racial and generational trauma on the mental well being of uh, the Latinx population and the Asian uh, Pacific Islander populations in our country. After we have those overviews, we'll take the time to uh, have Q&A and a panel discussion. For those of you who are interested in receiving continuing medical education credits, please see the code on the following slide uh, and make sure that you register and put the uh, applicable code in. If you're interested in receiving continuing public health credits, please visit the National Board of Public Health Examiners at this link. The information for the continuing medical education will also be put in the chat function. I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Sergio Aguilar Gajiola, who is a physician and also researcher in the clinical internal medicine department at the uh, University of California, Davis. He is the founding director of the Center for Reducing Health Disparities at UC Davis and the director of community engagement programs at the UC uh, Davis Clinical Translational Science Center. He is a past member of the National Advisory Mental Health uh, Council and also National Institute of Mental Health. He is past chair of the Board of Directors of Mental Health America and past president of the Board of Directors of NAMI California. He was co-chair of the Behavioral Subcommittee and a member of the Technical Advisory uh, uh, Committee of, of California. 
He's also a member of the National Advisory Council of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, and also Center of uh, Mental Health Services and board member of the California Healthcare Foundation, Physicians uh, for Health California and Public Health Institute. He is a national and international expert on health and mental health com comorbidities on diverse populations. And over the last 25 years, he has held several WHO and Pan American Organization Advisory Board and consulting appointments, and is currently a member of the Executive Committee of WHO's Mental Health Survey Consortium, and its coordinator for Latin America, overseeing population-based national surveys of Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Argentina, a regional survey of Brazil, and two survey surveys in Colombia. Mm -hmm. Dr. Aguilar Guajiola is the author of over 190 scientific publications. He is the recipient of multiple international, national, state, and local awards, and is currently serving as co-chair of the steering committee mm -hmm. of the National Academy of Medicine, assessing meaningful community engagement in health and healthcare. We are honored to have him present today, uh, and he will provide an overview that will guide us. I will also introduce the members of uh, Essence of Mana after his presentation uh, so that you all will be uh, familiar with their accomplishments as well. Thank you. And let's start with Dr. Aguilar Guajola's presentation. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wilson. I appreciate that kind introduction. And it's my pleasure also to uh, do this uh, session with Nani uh, Wilson and with uh, uh, Lueni Massina uh, on a topic that is uh, uh, of great interest to, to me and, and the center that I, I direct. So uh, what I'll do is to share my, uh, uh, my screen, hoping that technology is going to cooperate. <laughs> uh, can you see my slides? My, my slides? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And, and what I'll do is just to put it on a slide show. And uh, what I, what I'll, uh, I discussed it, this with Dr. Wilson, uh, that uh, I, I, I want to, uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to put uh, 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 things in perspective in terms of why mental health disorders are important. Is kind of provide a framework of uh, why it matters. Well, there are several things uh, in which mental health or mental disorders are first. One is that uh, uh, they disable the most people, you know, and you see there 26% of adults annually. Most of the, the disability is mild, but uh, disability nonetheless. Also about 6% are chronic and serious. Uh, actually, we call them uh, seriously persistent uh, mental illness. Uh, also, uh, it, it is the number one cause of lost wages through absenteeism and presenteeism. You know, a number one cause of missed uh, work days, a number one cause of uh, uh, suicide, a number one uh, most costly biomedical problem is really, really uh, costly. And, uh, you know, nonetheless, uh, mental health, uh, it is kind of the ugly duckling of public health uh, if we consider uh, that they tend to be uh, underfunded. And, and not only here in the U.S., but uh, 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 globally as well. And what I'll do next uh, is to summarize uh, for all of you uh, uh, about three decades of research in just a few slides. Uh, I, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, challenging task, uh, but, but uh, I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, it, it, there are six things that I would like to focus on when we think about mental disorders like depression, major depression, uh, you know, panic uh, attacks, uh, 
uh, uh, alcohol dependence or, or uh, you know, drug dependence. Uh, and that is that mental disorders are among the most prevalent classes of chronic diseases in the general population. In uh, population-based studies that have been done uh, here in the US, uh, about half of the population, that means 50% of the population is going to suffer from one or more mental disorders in their lifetime. And one out of four in some groups and one out of five in others uh, is uh, suffering uh, uh, in the last 12 months from a, a, a mental disorder. The other thing that is uh, characteristic is that they co-occur within themselves uh, and also with substance use disorders and with many medical conditions. For example, if someone suffers from uh, major depression, chances are that they are gonna be also with uh, some kind of anxiety disorder and also it may be accompanied uh, in uh, uh, with substance abuse. And also it uh, uh, co-occurs uh, with uh, conditions, uh, medical conditions like diabetes, hypertension, cancer, et cetera. The other thing that is very important to keep in mind is that typically uh, mental disorders have much earlier ages of onset, onset than other chronic diseases. And I'm gonna be back to this uh, topic to give you a little bit more information, but it's important to keep that in mind. The other thing is that uh, mental disorders are among the most disabling of all chronic health conditions. Just to give you a sense, you know, a study that the World Health Organization commissioned uh, to uh, Harvard, you know, the, the School of Public Health, uh, Back in 1996, uh, of what became the global burden of disease, they documented that if we consider if you, uh, uh, the top uh, 10 causes of disability, uh, five of those are mental disorders. Number one is major depression. Depression is devastating, and it can be devastating. But along with that, PTSD, uh, you know, uh, uh, substance abuse. Etc. The other thing that I mentioned already is that uh, mental disorders are associated with significant societal costs. It's extremely expensive to society, and uh, it, too, it, it is unfortunate that uh, uh, you know we 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 don't uh, provide more funding for something that uh, uh, can be so devastating. And the other thing that I really want to focus on is that. Only a minority with mental health needs receive treatment in the preceding year. We call these treatment gaps. In other words, people who suffer from one or more mental disorders and are in need of treatment right now, uh, very few of them are receiving the treatment. And to make that point, uh, I would like to, in, in a couple of slides, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, provide you with an example so you see uh, the challenge in terms of the very low utilization of services uh, for those who are in need of services. So this is uh, uh, something that I want to emphasize that uh, around one in five people, uh, and, and, and that is uh, 14 to 20 percent, have a current disorder. This is... Uh, 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 mental disorder. The other thing that is continues to be an eye opener for me is that uh, they uh, start early in life. You know, there is an early, early onset of mental disorders. Uh, for example, uh, uh, three, th uh, seventy-five percent of adult disorders uh, had a onset by age twenty-four, and fifty percent by age. 14. You know, I have a friend who has been doing the National Mental Health Service in the US, uh, Ron Kessler is his name, and he has called uh, the men mental disorders the chronic conditions of the youth because the early onset and how it negatively impact uh, people early in life. <clears throat> the other thing that is uh, uh, important to mention is that uh, 
the greatest majority of the mental disorders, they start with the first symptoms uh, two to four years prior to an onset of a diagnosable disorder. In other words, for example, someone who suffers from major depression, uh, which is a syndrome, uh, they uh, had the first symptom like two to four years prior uh, to the full-blown uh, disorder. This is important because there is a window uh, for prevention, for really intervening uh, uh, early identification and early pre prevention that really can uh, uh, you know, help uh, prevent uh, uh, sometimes uh, a lot of hardship. Um, so this is the slide that I was gonna uh, share with you. You know, this is data from SAMHSA. I'm, I'm uh, uh, in the International Advisory Council. And this is before COVID-19, by, by the way. And this shows the pervasive social and structural inequities uh, before COVID. So this is information going back to 2018. This is national data. And I, and this is for Latinos specifically, but uh, you know something similar is happening to African Americans, uh, and I will focus on this particular uh, condition. These are co-occurring any mental illness and substance abuse disorders in those who are 18 and older. And look at this this data of those who are in dire need of uh, treatments. Uh, of services, 93% of Hispanics uh, have no treatment in the past year for these co-occurring uh, mental illnesses. And this is not too different uh, 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 on Afri uh, African-Americans. In the same year, uh, uh, this number was, I think, uh, uh, 91%. So this is 19, uh, excuse me, 2018. And look at the data for 2019. It got worse, you know, from one year to the other, it was uh, the treatment gap uh, was 1% uh, worse than the previous year. And uh, I, I can, the data for 2020 or 2021 is not out yet, but I would venture to say that uh, this has worsened because of COVID. So one thing that I, I think I, I would like to emphasize is that the onset of mental disorders usually occur in childhood or adolescence, as I mentioned to you, although treatment typically does not occur until years later. Actually, uh, there are studies that on average, it takes about 11 years, 12 years for someone who started suffering from mental disorders uh, to, uh, for the first time, uh, uh, seek and find uh, uh, services. So, th so there is a there is a lot of uh, time that goes by with many complications. For example, a developing uh, developing a mental disorder at a very early age may have significant effects on things like uh, you know getting into school and achieving you know uh, basic degrees. And, and also workforce participation, also has an impact on interpersonal relations such as marriage and divorce, divorce, and, and, and also subsequent disabling physical conditions uh, like diabetes, hypertension, uh, uh, you know, arthritis, you name it. You name a specific uh, physical condition and mental disorders have a, a tremendous impact uh, as well. One thing that I want to, uh, to emphasize here is, uh, uh, is just to provide you with a little bit of uh, uh, information related to the topic uh, of uh, today's uh, 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 webinar. And, and, and that is uh, to, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, intergenerational trauma or generational trauma. A base, very basic uh, definition is that it includes trauma, which is uh, accumulation of stress. And I will focus a little bit more in, in some uh, examples about that. And adaptive characteristic that the, tr the trauma uh, uh, which took place 
for various reasons in a previous generation and are now manifesting similar adaptations in the present day. You know, in addition to being a researcher, I was also trained uh, in different types of therapies. Uh, my PhD was in clinical community, is in clinical and community psychology. And I was trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, and, uh, and, and, and one other, you know, uh, more kind of psychodynamic uh, therapy as well. And uh, what I can tell you is that uh, things that ha are happening, you know, parents uh, who are uh, depressed, it's likely that their kids are going to be depressed as well. And in some of the conditions like uh, bipolar disorder, there is a strong uh, uh, heritability, you know, that a strong uh, genetic component that is passed on from a generation to another. Uh, the other thing is uh, important to distinguish between stress and trauma. Uh, you know, all of us uh, experience stress, you know, I can tell you that uh, that has been the story of my life for during the pandemic with all the adaptations that have uh, had been needed to do. Uh, but the accumulation of large quantities of stress, toxic stress, some people call it, over long periods of time changes that experience. This is a, a, what uh, uh, many of us had been experiencing during COVID, toxic stress, as opposed to occasional stress. Uh, which uh, 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 is maybe associated with trauma uh, and that has an impact on the brain, you know, uh, uh, at the neuronal uh, level. Uh, I, I, I think that this pyramid that you, you see here, uh, uh, I see it uh, helpful and distinguishes between different types of trauma uh, from uh, intergenerational, developmental, historical, historical trauma, and in distinction, you know, uh, with the stress and the white base that you can see here, that uh, once again is related to uh, to uh, a, a very common experience that we uh, uh, all of us actually. I don't think that not, nobody escapes uh, stress. Uh, which happens to uh, the majority of the population, in, in, if not all the, uh, the population. I would like to let you know that, uh, you know, our, our uh, Center for Reducing Health Disparities had this three-part symposium last year uh, that we titled Trauma-Informed Care and Services for I Immigrant Families. So we look at trauma and immigration, which is a it is something that happens uh, not only with Latinos, even though I'm focusing on Latinos right now, but uh, with other populations. Uh, we work, for example, uh, in Solano County for uh, uh, about six years. We just finished a, a, uh, a project uh, uh, working with uh, Solano County uh, Behavioral Health Division. And we work specifically with uh, Filipinos, Latinos, and LGBTQ. And, uh, you know, this trauma and migration is a common occurrence uh, uh, in, in Asian populations, as well as uh, in, in, in the case uh, that, that uh, the, the, the Asian group that we focus on, Filipinos, uh, uh, certainly emerge as one of the uh, challenges that uh, they, they uh, have experienced. Certainly it happens with Latinos as well. A little bit about trauma and mental health. You know, uh, I'm an immigrant myself and I'm very sensitive. Actually, my uh, programmatic research has been for over three decades on migration and health and specifically mental health. So I, I, uh, I have a, a finger on this pulse and, and, and also uh, my heart is pretty much uh, in this area. And, and just to... Uh, make that connection of trauma, some of it is generational trauma and, and mental health. You know, uh, forced migration is strongly associated with trauma. And this is something that we tackle in the three symposium, uh, three part symposium that I mentioned to you. And it's important to distinguish uh, traumatic experiences like single events. You have some 
uh, examples there, like witnessing domestic violence, something that has occurred with uh, more frequency during the pandemia, and also chronic form, like ongoing physical, sexual, and psychological abuse, and maltreatment and neglect. The other thing that is important to keep in mind is something that uh, our Surgeon General uh, here uh, in California, the first Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine uh, Burke Harris, uh, has made it her career uh, to focus on. And those are adverse childhood experiences. And this, uh, once again, refer, refer to emotional, physical, sexual abuse, family violence. Uh, uh, all of these are examples of adverse uh, uh, ACEs. And this is uh, uh, often accompanied by contextual factors uh, as we are seeing them, uh, like uh, financial uh, uh, strain, uh, instability or displacement, food, in food in and housing insecurity, and substance abuse by a caregiver or, a, a, or an adult. And we know that ACEs have severe implications for uh, risk uh, of adverse mental health and physical uh, health, and as well as other, uh, uh, other uh, situations. So what is the harm to children, the harm of trauma uh, uh, for children? Well, in the short term, these are some of the things that happen, like separation anxiety and hypervigilance, depression, impaired attachment and bonding, uh, ambiguous uh, loss and grief, uh, difficulty sleeping and playing, behavioral disorders that may manifest in aggression and irritability, psychosomatic symptoms, withdrawal from their environment. And this is uh, how this is manifested in kids, uh, including adolescents, by the way. But there are also long-term uh, negative impacts on, on children from neuro neurodevelopmental consequences like cognitive deficits, uh, that uh, uh, happen in childhood and then as, are associated uh, with mood disorders, for example. Also observable effect on brain structure, uh, you know, in some specific uh, brain uh, uh, centers uh, in the circuitry as well. Uh, 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 an impact on brain development during adolescence, negative impact on immune functioning, uh, uh, you know, uh, also impact in the child's uh, basic emotional needs, uh, impaired memory, uh, etc. All of these uh, uh, things that uh, uh, these traumatic experiences may have in, in, in kids. But it also uh, harms uh, adults, you know, in the short term. Things like physical violence, threats, rape, uh, uh, had a severe impact on the immigrants' personal, social, and professional lives. Things like anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, substance uh, use disorders, behavioral psychotic, uh, behavioral problems, psychotic symptoms, etc. So, one thing I'm going to shift a little bit uh, to share with you uh, what is happening, what has happened, uh, and I'm going to focus on Latinos, but this is uh, applicable to other groups as well that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. So uh, what is happening right now and, and the, the, the most, uh, uh, in my opinion, impactful uh, 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 aspect of COVID is the people who have lost their, their lives. As of uh, two days ago, uh, here in the US, uh, it, 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 it was uh, 718,000 deaths. And the day before, on October 11, uh, because I had a, a, that uh, a, a, a slide on that, there were 2,000 less deaths. So in a matter of one day, uh, there were uh, 2,000 added. And these numbers will continue to increase, uh, unfortunately. But what I would like to, uh, uh, to share with you, uh, and, and this is happening also not only to uh, Latinos, as you can see here, uh, in the last row of this table, that in the case of, of Latinos, uh, uh, they, they have uh, 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 over two times higher probabilities of uh, death uh, than, than whites. 
But something similar is happening to African Americans. And this is here, uh, 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 the, the, uh, this is nationwide, by the way. And with uh, American Indians or uh, Native Americans, is uh, even a little bit higher than what is happening to Latinos and, and, and African Americans. But the, the real story about mortality, uh, certainly in California, and, and, and it is true also across the, the, the US, is that if we stratify, stratify by who is dying uh, more, uh, what, uh, and this is California data, that here, uh, 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 Latinos uh, are four times, a little over four times more likely to die than whites and uh, African-Americans nearly three times. Uh, but if we stratify, you know, uh, uh, build the onion in the case of Latinos, the mortality uh, 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 ratio for uh, the foreign born Latinos 20 to 64 years old with high school or less is 11 times basically uh, the death rate for, uh, of COVID than for whites. And a lot of this has to do with uh, uh, exposure in the workplace. You know, uh, Latinos and African-Americans, uh, you know, comprise a big uh, proportion of uh, essential workers who worked in uh, 15 uh, 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 essential worker sectors, uh, for example. One thing that is, uh, is sobering, and I have been thinking about this for some time, is that uh, you know, the pandemic, and this is uh, uh, data from 2019, as you can see here, and, and, to, uh, and the comparison with 2020, just one year. In one year, uh, the life ex expectancy at birth uh, was reduced in Latinos by three years. It was reduced by one year in whites and two years, basically, in, in, uh, 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 in, in a little over two years uh, with African Americans. This is a lot of, a lot of deaths that have been coming. And I'm impacted by this New York Times uh, paper that documented that for each person who dies of COVID-19, uh, experts say that there are at least nine newly buried which means that, uh, uh, you know, when we speak about uh, uh, 718,000 dead in the US and over 70,000 here in California, that behind each of those numbers, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, bereavement, you know, uh, uh, widow, widows, uh, widowers, uh, orphan kids, you know, grandparents that uh, were lost, uh, etc. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know, I like this particular paper because uh, it, it was heralding back at the end of uh, December that there was going to be this uh, uh, second wave referring to the mental health crisis attributable to mental health consequences of COVID-19. And then it says the magnitude of this second wave is likely to overwhelm the already frayed mental health system, leading to access problems, particularly for the most vulnerable populations. And if we, if we focus on kids, that I'm very concerned about the experiences of children and adolescents, uh, uh, they really have been uh, negative, in, negatively impacted and really we need to keep an eye uh, in these uh, age groups. Uh, uh, the crisis has hit children on multiple fronts. Many have experienced social isolation during lockdowns, family stress, a breakdown of routine and anxiety about the virus, school closures, remote teaching and learning interruptions uh, have set many back, uh, many, have set back many at school. Some parents have had uh, job and income losses, uh, you know, also housing and financial instability. And uh, all of this, uh, make, makes, uh, makes it work, uh, worse in terms of uh, parental stress. And I would, I would say that trauma, uh, you know, traumatic experiences that parents are, uh, you know, having uh, left and right. 
thousands of children have lost a parent uh, or grandparent to the disease, as I had been alluding to. You know, this is a very recent uh, report from the National Academies of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine that focuses, focuses on uh, uh, school age uh, kids uh, and their mental health and well being. And the quote uh, is uh, COVID 19 has caused unprecedented disruption in the lives of youth aged 10, uh, 10 to 18, leading them experiencing increases in mental health concerns. Addressing these negative impacts requires education leaders, school districts, state and local decision makers, parents, teachers, and youth to work together to ensure that young people have the support and resources needed to address their mental, emotional, and behavioral health needs in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a busy slide, but I just wanted to emphasize that uh, you know, uh, young people, uh, the kids, uh, and especially the adolescents, had been badly hit by what uh, Dr. Deborah Kessler, a colleague of mine uh, who is at, at the World Health Organization, uh, that uh, she identifies this triple, triple whammy, like a truncated education, diminished job prospects for, for the teenagers, and reduced uh, social contact with peers in the isolation that they had been uh, uh, experiencing. And there is a very uh, quoted uh, study from the CDC <clears throat> about the impact of COVID-19. And uh, they allude to one of the areas is uh, uh, that there has been a significant increase also in suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And, uh, and that this is happening is higher in, uh, in young uh, adults, uh, 18 to 24 uh, years of age, you know, and, and, and also minority racial ethnic groups, uh, uh, caregivers, and essential workers as well. This is, uh, I'm gonna finish very soon. Um, the other thing that is critical uh, to think about is, well, what's happening? What has happened uh, or is happening to those who already had a history of mental health problems. And these are kids who already had uh, uh, mental health issues. Well, according to this, uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, survey, uh, about 85, 81% agreed uh, that uh, the pandemic has had a, a much worse uh, impact on their mental health or a bit uh, worse, uh, as you can see on the slide. And one of the big challenges is that uh, there is very little access to, uh, to treatments. Uh, it's very difficult to receive treatments uh, when, when, when those, those are needed. This is the last slide. Just to, uh, to emphasize about the impactful events that we have gone through uh, not only during COVID, COVID plays a, uh, has played a key role, but before COVID, you know, in the previous administration, that uh, uh, in, in the case of Latinos, uh, it, it really had, a, a, you know, things like public charge, the threats of public charge had a tremendous impact on Latinos about accessing services, not accessing services. Uh, also, uh, the attempted uh, rollback of Donna Aston Tell, uh, and something that we have uh, been experiencing, uh, uh, you know, the racial unrest uh, in 2020 that was triggered by the murder of uh, George Floyd, and more, more, uh, more recently, the targeting of uh, uh, our uh, um, uh, Asian American and Pacific I Islander community. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with has been big had been victims of uh, 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 hate crimes, you know, with increased fear, anxiety, and depression, and also the impact that COVID uh, undoubtedly has had in these immigrant populations, uh, in which the services needed to be transitioned from in-person services to telehealth, uh, and with lots of uh, uh, consequences about that. So I'm going to stop uh, here and uh, looking forward to engaging in, in more conversation and, and, and to your questions. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Aguilar Gajola. I really appreciate your overview. It's providing a really great foundation for us to move forward. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Nani Wilson and Luini Masila um, as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen there so you can see their beautiful pictures. Um, both Nani Wilson and Luini are representing uh, Essence of Mana and they are uh, natives of uh, the San Francisco area. Nani Wilson is a San Francisco native who has been working for Asian American Recovery Services, also Health Right 360 for over the past decade and has been part of the groundbreaking community work in San Mateo and San Francisco counties. She provides through these services, through these organizations, a safe space for Pacific Islanders to come together and have dialogue around difficult topics. Nani's hands on experience with uh, those living and suffering in silence has increased her passion about empow empowering her community's voice. She believes that in order for the village to raise a child, a community must do whatever it takes to help provide a safe, nurturing environment so that our youth can flourish and to our future leaders. Nani has been teaching culturally specific parenting classes and facilitating community safe spaces to share awareness and dialogue on topics around mental wellness. Luini Masina was born and raised in the Bay Area. She is a San Francisco native as well and a proud young Samoan woman. Although her work and experience in nonprofit has only been a few years, she has been involved in community programs and organizations since the age of 12. Being raised in a culture that emphasizes one's tau tau or service to others, she aims to give back to the community by sharing resources and creating brave spaces to raise awareness on wellness in Pacific Islanders. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome both Luini Masina and Nani Wilson as our next speakers. Hi. I'm trying to show my video. Yeah, we're not able to do that right yet. Oh, there we go, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you for the electronic gurus that are able to make things happen like this. All right, great. Talofa, um, and welcome to our presentation on uh, generational trauma through a Pacific Islander lens. I think it's really important that we emphasize on that often in our community. We are under the API umbrella, but our community advocates have been really working on making sure that we actually fall under our own umbrella um, to tell our own story. So um, before I move forward, I'd like to, again, introduce Lulu, who will share a little bit about herself in addition to what was shared. Yes, Talofa, everyone. My name is Luen Masina, but I also go by Lou or Lulu. I am the project coordinator for the Essence of Mana program and have been part of the Health Right 360 family going on five years. But I have, um, as mentioned in my bio, I have been involved in community work since I was a child. Uh, I am a proud so Samoan woman, and I am also a proud San Francisco native. Let me just plug in the Giants. Go Giants tonight. Um, and I am so excited to speak today and just share insight from a Pacific Islander lens. Thank you. And Yorana, and that is hello in Tahitian. And my name again is Nani Wilson, and I've been a community advocate for over 40 years. Um, I started as a teenager and been just pushing ever since. Um, our primary uh, work focus here at Asian American Recovery Services, Essence of Mana, is really uh, a lot of work on stigma reduction um, around mental health, mental wellness, um, and also sharing, you know, awareness and resources with our community while connecting folks to service. And we know in order to do that, because there is so much stigma around mental health, um, that we also know we have to work with our service providers um, on how to better work with our diverse community. 
So we are going to give you just a brief snapshot, a brief snapshot of where we come from so you can better understand us now. So as you look at the slide here, basically um, you see Pacifica or Oceana, um, which is made up of uh, three subgroups. There's Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. So you may have heard in the past, however, um, you may heard people refer to us as polys, right? Um, but we want to be inclusive uh, to all our brothers and sisters because it's so important. So we want to make sure um, as we go through our presentation, you will hear us using Pacific Islanders, Pacifica or Oceana when referring to our community. Thank you, Nancy. So before you, we show many hierarchical systems in the islands. So first we have the Matai system of chiefs in Samoa. The Matai is one of the highest ranks in a Samoan village or a family. They are seen as the spokesperson and decision maker for the village or the family. So to the right, we have a monarchy. So this is the monarchy of Tonga, which operates on this system. And they're actually one of the last remaining countries to rule under a monarchy and a royal family. So in tradition, oh, in transition, next we have gender. Although Tonga rules under a monarchy, gender plays a role in their homes as well. So Tongan families, they are a matriarchal society. So you'll find in the Pacific Island community, there are a few jokes about Tongan males being a mama's boy. Well, that's because women are the most important um, in their homes and in their lives for not only themselves, but for their children and family as well. As well. Um, but whereas in Samoa, the dynamic is the opposite and men are the head of the household. So we also have the clergy. So religion is one of the core elements in the Pacific Islander culture. So clergy is seen as a head. And they some would even argue that they're higher than in Matai. So for instance, whatever is said by a faithau or a pastor or reverend is what should be honored and followed. So with all of these systems in place, it can lead to generational trauma through submission and silencing of one's voice. So whether or not you have a say or a decision in regarding the well-being of your family or choosing to stay in a relationship because your male partner says so. So this slide, we talk about the migration of Pacific Islanders coming to the US. So if you're in the Bay Area, area, you know there's a lot of polys or a lot of islanders, depending on where you are. So I've talked about the lifestyle in the islands, and now I transition to the start of life in America. So the Pacific Islander migration story is no different from many um, and others. So moving to the States for a better life, education, and more opportunities. So the map pictured is taken from a census and on this slide, it shows some of the most heavily populated areas of Pacific Islanders. So the Bay Area region is one of the few darkest shaded areas just because it's one of the most uh, heavily populated. So the San Francisco port, and if you know, um, it was also a naval shipyard. So in Hunters Point, it acted as a bridge to the US, which leads to the Samoan migration story beginning in the 1940s. This is when Samoan started to come to America through the military. And then Tongans followed and this, they started coming to the country around the 1960s, but this was through church sponsorships and um, missions. So as more and more Pacific Islanders started to migrate to the US, Houses became multi-generational and housed multiple families. And speaking of multi-generational homes, we have it listed as one of the few contributing factors to generational trauma in our communities. So being in a multi-generational home creates a different dynamic. And if you know, you know. So familial obligations can be one of the results of um, living in a multi-generational home. Your family's needs are a priority rather than yours. Um, you always have to come second before your parents, before your elders and your wants and needs are ultimately, they don't matter. So you must take care of the family and work to provide for them as well. These duties can tie into birth order, specifically talking as an oldest child. Me, as an oldest child, I am expected to become a pseudo parent to my younger siblings and carry the weight of all the responsibilities of my parents when they're not there 
even after my younger siblings become grown adults. So last in this column, we have gender. So gender roles I had mentioned before, and I had spoke about it in our previous slide. So when you are taught, when you're a woman, you are taught to be submissive and to obey, whereas males, that isn't the case. So also from personal experience, uh, so much more is expected of a woman than they are from a male. Thank you so much, Lou. And, you know, as Lou's talking, I can just feel my head shaking. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and that's that part, right? Because um, I understand it. You know, I also am the eldest of the family, so the responsibilities carry on. Um, and, you know, again, we, we talk about, we wanted to go back to where we came from, because really right now there's a big cultural disconnect. We have um, our, our community, right, which is kind of made up of elders, right? Elders who usually came from the islands, right? But then we also have multi-generational folks who are being born here. So we have kind of like this island way versus the American way, right? And many generational folks don't know how to grasp what their elders are saying. And so it's like, how do you um, assimilate here, right? And we know this, we see this, you know, like in the islands, missionaries came to the islands, right? And they were like, we're going to tell you how to dress. We're going to tell you what to wear. We're going to tell you what to believe in, what not to believe in those idols. You shouldn't dance. Um, you shouldn't be provocative. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. And so we ended up forming and following what they said, often um, creating this what is now the result of this big gap in between um, both of our different cultures. And then also language, right? Language is really hard. There's so many different dialects, right? I showed you the three different subgroups and there's so many different dialects. In our Pacific Honor dialects, there is no words for mental health, right? We've been working with community leaders to figure out how to describe, best describe, how can we find a root word to, to translate so that our community can understand. For example, like in Samoan, like um, they'll say ma'i something, right? And, and like ma'i is like when you have your monthly. And so that's a physical sickness, not a, a, a mental sickness. So we're still working on that. Um, and the great thing is there's been a lot of community leaders that are helping transition um, to find the appropriate words so that we can help our community connect. Um, and also, it's just so important. So I'll let Lou go ahead and take the next row. Thank you. So in this last column, we have religion. Religion is a huge Pacific Islander um, factor and can sometimes cause a shift in priorities. I had mentioned how important religion is. And some families would actually give their rent money to the church rather than keeping a roof over their head. We've seen this time and time again, families struggling all because they don't want church members to see that they're incapable of keeping up with their monthly tithe. So that's a huge thing that causes trauma within the home. Next we have discipline and corporal punishment. So this is just a little trigger warning, but seeing it firsthand and growing up as a Samoan, discipline tactics that were used on me were instilling fear and intimidation. And this was done all throughout the community. I've seen it in so many homes. Um, and we all know that in California, you're only able to spank a child with an open palm and not leaving a mark. But sometimes that wasn't the case in many homes. It, yeah, it wasn't the case. <laughs> um, so yes, but now we have, um, moving forward, we have stereotypes. So stereotypes of Pacific Islanders and this perception outsiders have of us, such as we're big, we're mean, we're unapproachable, we're savages. And some popular stereotypes were Samoan men are going to the NFL or that Tongans are good at rugby. And um, after being told, after being told some things for so long, you start to believe it and limit yourself to only that capability. With the pandemic creating a disconnect with the community, we were able to find an interactive software that maintained engagement. It's not the best, it's not the same as being in person, but it was something to stay connected. So while surveying the community, we asked the community members what were some of the taboo topics that you've seen within our culture and within our people? So some taboo topics that were seen uh, were mental health, were shame, religion, racism, colorism, domestic violence, drugs and money, just to name a few. 
Thank you so much, Lou. And, you know, we here, our community, we've, we've been working so hard and regarding stigma reduction, and then the pandemic comes, and it's almost like we just take 10 steps back, right? And so we knew it was so important when we were having these, these spaces to be able to do things like the polls and really just engage with our community. And so we wanted to talk about the VA. The VA is a space that we share. It's a nurture, it's a space that we share that's um, allows us to nurture a relationship. Like for Lulu and myself, you may hear her refer to me as auntie. And she's doing that out of respect as an elder. And so building connections and, and helping um, create bridges is the most important. And that's what we want to talk about as we have some other slides is that some of the programming we have um, is basically we like to refer to like the VA. Some of the examples of the VAW are Journey to Empowerment. Um, we had a, a, a Tongan community person uh, wanted to have a space where they could talk about taboo uh, or in English taboo topics in her community. Um, she was able to see an MFT and she was like, we need a space where our Pacific Islanders can talk about things. I'm learning now how important it is to talk to someone. So we were able to collaborate with other uh, community leaders and create this safe slash brave space um, for our community, you know, very grassroots. Every first Friday of the month, we'd come together um, and, you know, we talk about things that weren't necessarily talked about, but needed to be talked about, like child abuse, like rape, molestation, domestic violence, violence in general, right? Being LGBTQ, um, self-identity, self-love, you know, death, trauma, um, Lou was talking about um, clergy, so religion, right? Um, there's a, a lot more um, atheists now because of just experiences, right? Um, and also we wanted to do other things like, you know, writing exercises and heal and paint. We've done several heal and paints. And so we did this all in person. But when the pandemic came, we were like, oh, my goodness, how are we going to connect? How are we going to stay connected? We're hearing from our community that they're feeling anxious, they're, they're nervous, they're worried, they don't know what's going on. So we were able to then learn how to get on Zoom, get on things like this, and, and start to navigate the virtual world. Um, and so just in regards to like the essence of uh, monitoring to empowerment, we are now celebrating nine years this month of every first Friday, creating a safe, brave space for Pacific Islanders. So anything can be done if you just put your mind into it and there's a need of the community. Then there's the essence of Mana program, which we're able to provide a free 12 week program for parents, guardians, caregivers, excuse me, and um, adult siblings on how to improve communications with our youth of today. We know there's a lot of things happening virtually, and our kids are five steps ahead of us. And so we were very concerned also because of violence in our community. We wanted to see how could we get into have discussion with our, our folks about what's going on in the homes because once the kids leave the home, things happen outside. And so we are able to talk about current trends, right? We are able to talk about what's going on with vapes, um, alcohol, other drugs, you know, also with like, if our kids are LGBTQ, how to embrace them. We also have Pacific Islander digital stories, which are awesome because they're short three minute stories that talk about these taboo topics, but it allows an opportunity to open the door for our community to talk about something and it's really just almost like broken the door open for people to come forward and be like that happened to me or, oh my goodness, I'm not alone and so creating a connection right and um, we've also talked about things like human trafficking it's real. Our parents don't want to believe it, but it's happening right down the street from where we are. And also like apps with our parents on apps, how to, to stay on top of, of what your kid is doing on the phone, right? So just basically sharing tips and tools, um, leading to a, a more loving relationship um, and doing this all through a cultural lens. That's the most important part, right? It's for our people, by our people. And it really makes a difference because the participants that have come don't have to explain anything because we understand the culture because we are part of the culture. 
And so then, you know, with this pandemic, we also were worried because of the increase in anxiety um, and also the increase of Pacific Islanders, also a high percentage, even though we may be a small population compared to others, we have a high percentage of death rate. And also with the variant too, it's starting to take out more and more of our folks. We are going to funerals on a regular basis. And when I say regular basis, I'm talking about weekly. That is too much. So you don't even get to mourn because next week here comes something else. So that's a whole nother level of uh, mental illness and mental hurt that we're feeling. And so, you know, we just wanted to figure out how to stay connected. So we were able to go um, Talanoa, which basically means talk story um, on our Facebook page where we usually post flyers. We ended up going live and we've been going live every Tuesday. Um, we bring people from the community to come in and highlight them, right? People who often would not do that were like, come share us, share your insight, share your lived experience. And it's been really powerful because since May, we celebrated a year um, and we've been able to address and keep folks updated on things around the pandemic, around COVID, you know, safe practices and things like that. Um, and so that's the part that's so important for us is to stay connected. Sorry. Um, so with all of these great spaces of VA, these are just some of the outcomes we were able to witness within the community. So our first is self-care. As mentioned, being Pacific Islander, it's all about the collective. And in this space, we were able to define what is self-care for ourselves. How are we able to fill our cups while pouring into others and how we're able to continue to pour? Um, while identifying self-care, we were also able to embark on a journey of self-identity. Being born in the diaspora is, it's, it's tough. Often, oftentimes we feel culturally disconnected because we can't speak the language or we've never been to Samoa or the islands. So we're able to affirm one another's identity and empower each other to know that you are enough, which leads to finding and utilizing our voice. There is so much power in one's voice and we just want to empower the community so that we're able to find this and, and become future leaders and advocates and hopefully have future generations see that we are enough. So we're also able to share resource, resources and build connections to support um, some therapists and even life coaches. So some resources, there are organizations and individuals that are Pacific Islander, that they look at, they look like us. And if they're not Pacific Islander specifically, then they're Pacific Islander friendly. They know how to work with Pacific Islanders. They're caring and um, they can relate. And so referring back to what Auntie Nani had mentioned about bringing on folks to our Talano Tuesdays, we're also able to have these people involved in these spaces of VA. So some folks have played a part in creating Journey to Empowerment. They've been guest speakers on Talon on Tuesday. So these are all folks who are involved in the community and just trying to, trying to progress as one and break stigma. And navigating the wave. In this presentation, you hear us say the word community a lot. We know. And that's intentional. It's because we are a collective. So if you are well, then all is well and vice versa. So together we are able to understand community resiliency. And Sinani had mentioned how hard we have been hit by COVID and having funerals week after week. And one good thing that has come out of it is just seeing how resilient our community is and how we are able to be there for one another during this time. So while we're able to notice our resiliency, we're also able to create meaningful dialogue around, around conversations like around COVID and these other taboo topics and Tylenol and creating a shift in engagement by bringing folks in, bringing more folks in we are able to spread more awareness and talk more about mental health and break that stigma, ultimately ending cycles of generational trauma for future generations. You see a canoe before you and the community is on this canoe and we must navigate as one. I know it sounds corny, but you know, we're, we're one. Um, and there is a Tongan proverb that we like to use a lot and that's piki piki hama kai vai vai manava, 
which means let us link our outriggers so that we can enjoy life. Hey, Lou, you know, um, really briefly, I wanted to add, and maybe we can just tell Nora real quick is, you know, also funerals, you know, we talked about funerals, Pacific Islanders, funerals are the utmost important thing. So if you know any Pacific Islanders, or you work with any Pacific Islanders, and you see them absent, um, or out of school or out of class for over a week, that's because they're dealing with their funeral. When it comes time to a funeral, Lou, what is our responsibility? Finances, a lot of the financial burden, it's not on insurance. It's not, in, it's not on insurance, it's on the family. It's coming together. And uh, one thing that we call in the Samoan culture, as you know, is fa lave lave. That is your obligation to the family to contribute. And although we make jokes about um, having fa lave lave and always have to give in and uh, give money, sometimes it, it's something we know we have to do. It has to be done because if it can't be done, then there's nowhere else we can ask for money or or bring money in. So it's something we have to do. Thank you, Lou. And, you know, we've had people in the community lose their homes over um, taking out loans. And we've had folks lose grades in school because they didn't show up for two weeks. Because even if you can't financially put in, you need to be there to cook, to clean, to prepare for people that are coming. And so there's this obligation, right, that is expected. That also causes stress, especially for a lot of our college students. So I just wanted to touch base on that. Um, And so now you see this slide, right? Now you see CLC the seal at the bottom on his little rock. And CLC could be looking like the San Francisco giant seal very much. We just couldn't find his cap. I think it fell in the water. Um, But CLC is kind of feeling isolated and he's feeling depressed on that rock. You know, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of fear. And we know that Oceania is where we come from, but there's uncertainty in the waves, right? The unknown. He doesn't know if he can handle the bay water, right? And so our culturally, our culturally specific programming helps to bridge the gap to wellness and to our Pacific Honor community. So navigating these virtual waves during this pandemic has allowed us to really have a universal reach. So for an example, for Drink to Empowerment, which I talked about, we've been able to um, have participants attend from Fiji, right? How awesome is that? And for our Essence of Mana classes, we've had some participants from the island of Samoa participate in our 12-week course. That is so powerful. And then on our Talanoa Tuesdays every week, we have viewers that are watching from like Washington State and from Singapore on a regular basis. So that just is a small snippet of how powerful our reach has been able to get for our community. And it's really important, especially during these times, because we know it's going to take our people to help our people. And so by providing these spaces, we're able to empower our community to help them find their voices and really give them a sense of healing and and connectiveness, which is so important during this time. Because like the doctor was saying, you know, all of this this impact just continues to increase. And so it's so important. And and we're just really um, able and glad that we can share this with you. Here we start to wrap up with a proposal for a call to action. So creating culturally specific programming for Pacific Islanders, it is so easy to be lost under the AAPI umbrella. So we want to create programs that address disparities within our own Pacific Islander culture and community. It's important to have these programs for our people created by our people. No one knows us better than ourselves. Sometimes, right, Lou? Sometimes. <laughs> and then, you know, we also need to collect and disaggregate data. Data. What is that? We don't even know what that is. Oh, when you ask about Pacific Islanders, you are very lucky if you find any data, but we're working on it. We are working on it. We know that, you know, data, it's very foreign to us, um, but we know how important it is for funding and all, often um, creating and finding information. But we have to remember also our data basically is story based. We are storytellers of our history, oral storytellers, right? But, you know, we're working to be the bridge. We are still working on that. We are starting to figure out, you know, how we can help our community better understand the importance of collecting data and and also the, the fearfulness that they have on answering questions or filling out surveys and really helping them to better understand the bigger picture 
Um, so it's really important that we also disaggregate our data, um, again, for Pacific Islander information, not just API in general. And you're starting to see that more and more, um, even on the census, you'll notice that. So, you know, we, we, we thank our elders um, who we fall on the shoulders of them carrying us into this so that we can, you know, really be a, have a true view of our community and you know it's so important to be transparent in everything you do so why not be transparent when collecting our data so our last item pacific islanders should be invited to spaces to tell our story we say our story because it is our truth pacific islanders deserve to be invited and included in these spaces yes i said invited um, if you know any pacific islanders then you know we won't go anywhere unless we're invited it don't matter if you tell us, oh, yeah, let's go. But if you give us a formal invitation, we'll come. So, um, yes, we just want to be heard and to share our story. Yes, and we know it takes a village to to uh, heal us. And so we need to be the ones to be there. So, you know, we really keep um, advocating for our college students to continue to pursue a higher education. Um, we know how important it is to see somebody that looks like us when we go to talk to them, be it a, a health professional, a doctor, a lawyer, whoever. We need to have people that look like us. I mean, I just want to share a Pacific Honor quote with you. Um, we shall not be defined by the smallness of our islands, but by the greatness of our ocean. And this is by Dr. Apelli Haofa. Um, and so next slide, please. I just wanna say on uh, behalf of everything, you know, it's been very important for us to come and share space with you all. We're very appreciative. Um, you know, often we're instructed to fit into a box, but um, you have to be told to do something this way, or, or maybe you should, do this way to cater this audience, but you know, please don't get me wrong. We're very appreciative that there are even boxes for us to check, um, but we also recognize that um, you know we have to be our authentic self, and that's the most important part is being who we are. And so, in closing, we would just like to say to each and every one of you, Fafatai Lava, Maloapuito, Maruru, and so that translates thank you in Samoan. Tongan and Tahitian. And may each and every one of you continue to be blessed in all that you do. And thank you for allowing us to share this space. What a wonderful presentation. I thank you both for honoring us with your presentation, for sharing our space. I'm glad that we could invite you to participate and share your very unique uh, perspective on uh, not only the health, uh, but mental health of the Pacific Islander community. I think all too often uh, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders are grouped together where there are very distinct needs, um, very distinct experiences, and we are seeking to share more of that with our students. So now we're gonna transition to uh, more of a panel discussion with you all. Uh, Dr. Gail Cummings will moderate the, the uh, panel discussion, and I'm obviously going to uh, poke in uh, a few questions here and there as well. Uh, and we welcome you all to, um, uh, to chime in. After the panel discussion, we're going to open it to uh, Q&A from our, uh, our uh, participants, who will begin populating the question and answer feature in the webinar, and will facilitate asking those questions of you all. Uh, at the conclusion of, of our uh, moderation. Yes, and I know, I don't know, can you hear me? I'm still having trouble with my headset. Okay, what, what a, a wonderful combination of presentations. I just wanna, again, um, on behalf of, of, of the Turo Public Health Program, thank both Essence of Mana and uh, Dr. Sergio Aguilar. Uh, Gaxola for presenting today. This is uh, a really unique um, uh, opportunity because, uh, again, providing that big overview that um, is so important, especially with uh, understanding sort of that those deep connections with the impacts of just inequities themselves, but the compounding of that uh, uh, on children with regard to COVID-19 was so important, such an important and powerful reminder to all of our communities to, to be considerate as we, as we kind of continue to heal and rebuild 
Um, but also, as, as uh, Deirdre mentioned, really um, getting a fascinating historical perspective on the Polynesian uh, community, the contributions, and really um, making, you know, reminding us of, of that importance of ensuring that we are able to disaggregate that data, which is so important. I, it sounds like you have been working with uh, my colleague, Dr. Robin Battle, who I know is sharing uh, with you that importance to, to, to take ownership. Um, and um, sometimes, you know, there, there, there is a lot of hesit hesitancy, as we know, um, with, with uh, lots of communities um, to, to provide that data and really um, understanding the importance of that as a necessity for, uh, for getting the funding you need to move things forward. So congratulations for all the work that you all have done throughout this, throughout this pandemic. Um, I want to just open it up with a couple of, of questions and then we'll certainly go to um, our audience to, to um, get their feedback as well. So I wanted to start off with you, uh, Dr. Aguilar Gaziola. Um, uh, out, outside of sort of the clinical settings and, and interventions um, and maybe some structural changes, what do you think, uh, what, what interventions or structural changes do you feel that uh, might be most powerful in terms of moving the needle to close that treatment gap that you talked about? That's a, wonder, a wonderful question. And, uh, and it requires... Uh, a systemic uh, uh, approach, you know, to how to transform uh, service delivery, for example, and not only uh, just delivering services, but accessing services. A lot of the issues uh, uh, reside on, on uh, uh, just being able to make it into the doors of service. You know, one of the things that uh, happens with Latinos and other populations, it's not just Latinos, is uh, the stigma of mental illness plays a very, very important role. Actually, stigma uh, is the most important factor for preventing someone uh, to getting into, into services. I mentioned that uh, it takes on average 11 or 12 years. Once they started with a mental illness just to get into services. And uh, so uh, issues of, uh, of access and, and there are different, different barriers that uh, we need to take into consideration. For example, uh, individual barriers. And once again, a stigma plays a, a critical role. Uh, uh, you know, I remember this poster out of uh, the National Institute of Mental Health. This was years ago, at the beginning of the uh, 2000s, uh, that uh, had a, a caption uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the, the, the Latino culture, uh, saying that uh, in Spanish, saying that the Latino culture is a culture of silence as it comes to mental illness because it's not uncommon, especially in men, to really or deny, or even if, if they, uh, you know, those who are affected by depression, let's say, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, not being willing, especially in men, not being willing, willing to seek uh, treatment. Uh, and there are other conditions that are more, uh, more uh, calm, I cannot say complex, but more stigmatizing, like uh, schizophrenia, for example, you know, different types of schizophrenias. And it's not uncommon for the family to feel shame about that and to put them in closets, basically. I mean, uh, not physically, but, uh, you know, uh, not allowing them or not expose them uh, in some ways. So, uh, 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 it is barriers at the individual level, barriers at the, the community level as well. You know, there are not nearly enough uh, 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 bilingual and bicultural uh, uh, providers, you know, who really can uh, provide services to this, uh, to this group. Uh, one thing uh, uh, that I have been saying for years is that it is one thing 
uh, for getting into the doors of service. But uh, there is data that shows that uh, at least 50% of, uh, of, of, of those who make it uh, don't return for a second time. And of course, the, the question is what happened the first time? Well, we know what happens, uh, but they don't feel identified. You know, they are not feel welcome. They are not embraced. They are not treated with dignity and respect and with understanding. You know, just imagine someone who suffers from major depression with the insecurities, with the, you know, uh, the tendency to catastrophize. Uh, I mean, being floated with negative uh, thoughts and, and, uh, uh, and, and to come into a place after taking two buses and getting into a place in which people don't speak the language and that they would, uh, you know, uh, see them with, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, you know, a, 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 a face of disdain as, as many experience. And uh, they won't return. They won't return, no matter, uh, you know, actually Latinos, one of the things that happen is that many, uh, they come uh, for services uh, until they are falling apart. You know, one of the things that uh, we did in Solano County, actually, we, we, we had this uh, community-based approach uh, for those three historically underserved populations that I mentioned, uh, Filipinos, Latinos, and LGBTQ is that a good proportion of them uh, enter uh, the system, the mental health system through crisis services, okay? And, and that is not a good way to do it because uh, the services tend not to be as effective and very expensive, you know? It is like going through emergency services. They are not, uh, you know, well-equipped to really uh, provide continuity of care. And uh, so it, it is, uh, it is uh, individual barriers, community barriers, and societal barriers. You know, and still we are facing uh, all sorts of stigmas uh, related to, you know, uh, people just in general, uh, by the most part, don't understand and, and are scared of people with mental illnesses. They think that they are violent that they, you know, uh, uh, which, are, which are stereotypes, you know, sometimes perpetrated by the media. So when people ask me, you know, how to uh, solve or how to approach these, these things, I, I, I tell them, uh, you know, about the five A's as a mnemonic. One is uh, availability of services, accessibility of services, appropriateness of services that has to do with culture and language, and for any group, by the way, then uh, advocacy, because for a lot of people, navigate the health systems is extremely complicated. You know, uh, uh, it, it's not easy. They need help to, to navigate it. And then affordability. You know, there are a high number of percentages uh, who are who don't have insurance, and yet uh, they will need services. Uh, so uh, th those are just a few things that uh, have to be addressed in order to improve uh, access uh, to care and utilization of services. Yes, uh, thank you so much for kind of walking us through that. And as you were speaking, I was uh, thinking about Nani and uh, Lou's presentation because there's so many parallels that you kind of uh, alluded to and yep. um, I, I, and they're shaking their heads as, as you were oh, talking they a did lot. A beauty, they, so, they, they, they did a beautiful job. I know I'm very yeah, so pleased. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if they would like to add anything, um, especially around stigma, because that certainly is something that they, they spoke a lot about um, with re regard to the Pacific Islander community. I don't know if you'd like to share yeah, I, I just think it's so beautiful. First of all, I love the A's. Um, we'll be using that and quoting you for sure, because, you know, often we, we may sound like a broken record to our community, but we know we're just the seed planters and the waterers and time will be the one to nurture it. Right. And everything you said was like, yes, you know, we see these obstacles all the time. 
we can connect folks to resources, but it doesn't mean we're going to get it, get them to the front door. We often try to do that soft handoff, right? But it, in reality, and let's be transparent because that's my favorite word, is that to get them in the door, you need to know somebody on the other side as well, because there's so many barriers that I've seen people just like fall down and not want to get back up or deal with it, right? And you know, in the Pacific Honor Community, oh, the coconut wire is faster than the cell phone or any other wire. Um, and so, you know, but the one thing that is important and we always keep saying is recovery is possible. It may not happen right away, but recovery is possible from anything, from, from anything. And so um, I just really appreciate that. And Lou, did you wanna share as well? Thank you, Auntie. I believe both of you had shared you took the words right out of my mouth, so thank you so much. One, one thing, if I may, uh, uh, Gail, and uh, uh, that uh, I think that uh, there are many commonalities between our groups, uh, uh, perhaps more commonalities than, than differences. And one of them uh, that is important to, to talk about is resiliency. You know, that no matter what the odds and no matter, uh, you know, the traumatic events, no matter the experiences that uh, uh, would impact, uh, especially the kids, sometimes for life, uh, you know, we, we stand up and we continue. You know, I, I'm, uh, I'm working, for example, with farm workers during the pandemic, doing quite a bit of work uh, in that population. And boy, uh, the, the stressors, you know, the uh, difficult adverse circumstances that they face over and over again. And there, there they are, you know, working sometimes seven uh, days a week from 4.30, 5, 5 a.m. until 5 p.m., uh, you know, Monday through, uh, through Monday, basically, uh, or through Sunday. Sometimes they, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm in awe. And I think uh, uh, often we, we tend to, to look for the deficits, you know, but we have to look much more intendedly, deliberately for assets and for strengths. And our populations have them, you know. And, and I think that we need to tap into that resiliency that our groups have. Yeah, no, thank you so much for uh, even highlighting and lifting up the commonalities, uh, especially across, across so many of our communities that um, are underserved. And I think uh, what we, we are seeing, especially with regard to COVID, um, is that again, connecting the importance of our individual health to the health of our community, to the health of our neighbors. And when we look at how, how um, our, our communities have come to this country, whether by force or immigration, um, that collective unity is really what was a part of um, sort of in, in ensuring that resilience that, that you both, both talked about. So thank you so much for, for li lifting that up. And I don't wanna um, take over. I see uh, Deirdre Wilson is showing her face. So she's saying, let's open it up. <laughs> the rest of the audience well i have a i have a couple of questions um that that i'd like to to ask uh as well um both groups mention stigma and and one of the things that we seek to do is to uh train a new group cohort of uh public health practitioners that are both clinical and non-clinical um practitioners who uh, we hope to put out in the community. And so one of our goals is to equip them with the tools necessary to help a diverse cross-section of populations. Um, and so I'd like to know what we can do. So if you're outside the culture, if you're not, uh, you know, Latinx, if you're not Pacific Islander, if you're not African American, if you're not, um, you know, Asian American, what can our students do to close that gap or bridge that gap, in other words, to bring in and reach uh, these different communities and successfully um, help them, not only with mental illness, but uh, encourage them uh, in preventive health care. And so we really want our students to, um, to go away with some of these tools or at least the ability to, to find more information about how they can, can bridge that, that gap. 
That's a great question. You know, often we've been asked this before, especially like around um, alcohol and other drug recovery, like how can we hit the Pacific Honor community? And what I'm about to say may not um, meet the guidelines of uh, <laughs> training courses, but you know what? I'm about keeping it real. You ask me a question, I will give you um, my whole heart um, observations and knowledge is that you know, for Pacific Honors, let's say um, you have to be inclusive to the family. You have to invite the family in to be part of the answer. Um, you can, you know, treat maybe the young adult, um, and even though they're an adult in their family concept, they're still not an adult. It doesn't matter. They could be 35 when you're still not grown when you're living in a household of multi-generations. And, and also um, including them because they're the ones that are actually going to see and live with that, that individual um, past the treatment period. Um, and so it takes that supportive service. And then the other part too is that you have to be welcoming. You have to be environmentally aware that, you know, um, we, we all believe in breaking bread is very diverse in all our communities, but we know you can't sit there and be like, let's go have a cheeseburger. But, you know, maybe you can have some fruit on your table. You know, I know candy is not the best thing, but some kind of token of exchange, right? Because feeding your body feeds your soul and, and really just having some kind of insight on um, better understanding and let letting the person also speak, you know, let them be the teacher. Yes, you may be going to school, you may have all these letters behind your name, but let the participant or the client be the expert and, and share and connect. So then they get to find a way to be connected to you as the individual. And I think that's why we've been so successful is about we've been able to build relationships with people in the community who may not have trusted the system, but they trust the individual. And so that would be a little bit of my insight. Thank you so much. Uh, just to go off of Antinani and her answer, I would also say not to make assumptions that the community understands what mental health is. We had talked about this language barrier. We don't have a word that translates into depression or anxiety. And to be honest, I didn't hear the word depression until I was well into high school. So this is something that we don't talk about at home. So if you do have a client who is Pacific Islander and first thing you lay on to them is, oh, you have anxiety. Um, don't assume that they automatically know um, and understand that. And, and beautifully said, you know, it's like totally resonates uh, with me what uh, both uh, uh, Nani and, and, and Lueni mentioned. Uh, but two, two other things uh, be, uh, that come to mind. One is, uh, 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 I remember this article, I think that it was on the New York Times, uh, and the title is, is stuck with me. And that, that, that is, uh, Doctor, shut up and listen. And I think that uh, we have to learn how to listen uh, without interfering, you know, and, in a, and, and that, that would be fantastic uh, for the students in any discipline, you know, to really listen uh, to what is happening, especially in the service, uh, in the services, uh, uh, you know, uh, this discipline. Uh, the other one that is so much important uh, uh, is compassion, you know, is that uh, just really learn how to put ourselves on the shoes of others, which is very much uh, hand by hand with listening, you know, but to show that there is a genuine interest uh, and, and uh, you know, that uh, we are there. Uh, to really support without judging, you know, uh, there are many techniques that can be can be used uh, uh, by decades, you know, uh, of uh, 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 technique refinement, refinement. But I think uh, if uh, if you tap into those human qualities of just listening and and being compassionate and being passionate as well about the work. Uh, is, is, uh, is great lessons for, for the students and for anybody, you know, certainly for me as well. I love that. And, you know, I also want to share Dr. Thomas Aragon um, has yeah. said to us, he said, culture is health. Boom. There it is right there. Culture is health. Yeah. How powerful is that? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. No, there is something similar in Spanish, uh, Nani. In Español decimos, la cultura cura. Or culture cures. Culture mm -hmm. cures. And I think that it does. Mm -hmm. It's at so many levels. I, I see it over and over again, you know. Uh, in myself, you know, in these 19 months that I have been at home, boy, I have learned to listen at night, for example, uh, music, <laughs> uh, music uh, uh, and, and dances and, and, and uh, that goes back to our roots. And I'm so uplifted every night uh, or almost every night, whenever I can, I do that and, and and, uh, uh, you know, uh, it takes me sometimes two hours to listen because I, I love it. I, I just I just passionate about that. Uh, that is culture, la cultura cura. Thank you all for an inspiring presentation and panel discussion. We do have one question. Uh, we don't have any others. I, I would like to at least ask this question. Uh, and it's uh, uh, focused on um, how COVID has affected children. And it's an issue that uh, has come up in uh, many, uh, I, I guess, circles. And it says, if we ever had to uh, go into another lockdown, what do you think could be implemented to uh, curtail the decline in children's and uh, youth's mental health? And so what can we do with both those groups? I'd like to kind of open it up to both groups. What can we do in the event that we'll have to go into another lockdown, be it um, something temporary or, or more long-term? There are many things that, I, no, go ahead. Manny. No, I was going to say, we're all silent no. because we're afraid if we say the what we think, it might be projected like soon. <laughs> Go, doctor, please. No, no, after you, after no, you. No, that's please. what I was thinking, like, oh, my goodness, please, I'm trying not to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I, uh, I, I, I convinced that no one has escaped either directly or indirectly of having been impacted by COVID. You know, uh, it really has transformed uh, uh, lives. In, in deep ways, uh, you know, who would have said that uh, uh, myself, that I, I used to travel constantly and uh, that I had been here at home basically since uh, March 2nd of last year, you know? And I love it because sometimes uh, I found myself at 7 a.m. in LAX, for example, and in a Sunday and thinking, what the hell am I doing here? And, uh, you know, being able to be with my family. Uh, uh, so uh, that's a very positive thing for me that, uh, that I'm, I'm home. I, 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 I'm looking at my wife and, and uh, thank goodness for her. You know, uh, we have been married for 45 years and, and, and I love it. I, 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 we, we spend more time now than, than certainly before being in touch with the, our kids, the, you know, our, we have five grandchildren. All of those things are, are just, uh, uh, just uh, terrific. But uh, uh, one thing that I was going to mention is that uh, it, it's very likely that we have been impacted uh, by anxiety, by, you know, depressive feelings, by uncertainty, by, you know, uh, 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 feeling insecure about things, uh, and uh, and I think that that's an, a universal kind of kind of a thing. So it, it is what what are the resources that can possibly uh, help it in that regard? And just very quickly, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, my my center had been collaborating with the Department of Healthcare Services, the Behavioral Health Division, and also with UCLA and the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission to come up with a, a website, uh, which is part of CalHOPE. And CalHOPE uh, is being championed by the, our Surgeon General here in California. And, uh, and the, the, uh, we came up with a website, two websites actually. One is in English, the other one is in Spanish, and it's being expanded to eight other languages. 
uh, and it's called uh, Together for Wellness. And in Spanish is Juntos por Nuestro Bienestar. If you Google it, yeah, just Google it, you are gonna get it. And, and what we, we, we did uh, is to come up with a series of videos, of welcoming videos in both languages. And then there are like six different, different uh, 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 areas, like, uh, you know, uh, 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 emotional manage, managing uh, or managing our emotions, like uh, what to do with kids, you know, small kids, uh, to help them. Uh, you know, through the pandemia, with lots of resources on uh, uh, which are developmentally, I mean, the, the uh, uh, appropriate, you know, uh, uh, and, and also grief and losses. As I mentioned, this has been a, a major, major impact, uh, and as well as uh, a, a, a few of other, a few other things. You know, there are applications that are, all of that is free. All of that is free it, and is very, very uh, curated. You know, we are very selective of uh, you know having resources that hopefully are are, are uh, helpful uh, for for folks. So uh, uh, that is a resource, I think. Thank you so much, Nani or Luini. Um, yes, so thank you for the question. Um, one thing that comes to mind is, of course, spend time with your children. I don't mean being in the other room while they're on the phone and you're over here watching Netflix in the front or the living room. That's not the, the time I mean spending um, with your child. I mean, being with your child, ask, ask, or sorry, actually asking what they need. I know we assume, oh, they're depressed or they're sad because we don't see them um, interacting with other children or um, other folks, but do we actually sit down and ask them what they need for their own mental health? We can even break down mental health. Um, like the doctor had said, there are so many resources I know here in North County on the peninsula, we have like the Daily City Youth Health Center that are working tire tireless, to, <laughs> that are working hard, <laughs> sorry, I'm stumbling on my words, but that are working hard to make sure that the, um, that our youth, their mental health is okay. I know a lot of the time um, I'm guilty because when we first hit the pandemic, all I could think about was my own mental health. And I do have younger siblings and cousins and they, they never, I assumed, oh, they're okay, they're kids, they're resilient, they'll, back, they'll bounce back. But also having to remind myself that they're humans too. They need that interaction. They have mental health struggles, even at the age of seven, eight, or nine. So being able to check in on them, on them, and also just reflecting back on the past year, what worked last year when we first went on on lockdown, what didn't work, what can we do differently this time if we were to go into lockdown? Um, were they receptive to activities such as the poll where we were able to interact with them? Like it wasn't a game, but it was more so educational and not something that involves a lot of screen time. So just, just being a good listener, like the doctor had said, being a good listener and, and having a conversation with them. Um, yeah, I get so busy with my life, I just forget to check in on the young ones. And I'm like, I think you'll be good. But then little do I realize, you know, they could be struggling just as much as I'm struggling. So um, that that's what I would have to say. That's awesome, Lou. And then I would just want to share, um, I think it's important that we have to be creative and brainstorming because we have definitely been riding some waves and we've seen that the kids did not want to go back to school and then go back to uncertainty. The school districts were unsure. They're just kind of figuring it out as we go. I think we have to figure out how to have less Zooms, that's for us adults as well. <laughs> and really, you know, how can we connect them back with nature because this isolation and stuff has taken them away from being social. And, you know, like, I'm like, okay, let's see who all these tech companies, like let's give each family a tree to plant in the yard and some fruit and vegetables to be self-sufficient. Like, let's get them back to the basics of mother nature so that they can still be busy and not always be on the virtual thing. Because, you know, I didn't even know my own granddaughter was 
like, yeah, she was in class, but she had all these other tabs open too, right? And I'm like, oh my goodness, she's only 11 and she knows how to do all that. I don't even know how to do all that. So, you know, they're very creative and with it. And so how to, how to get them back to the things like the doctor was saying, like music, like appreciation of having some just music time and not necessarily the TV. And I'm a guilty person too. The TV helps me unwind. I love to binge watch. That's my self-care, right? But there's other things too. So figuring out how we can you know, just keep them because I know parents too are stressing over how am I going to teach my fourth grader how to do this math that I don't even know my own self. And so the kids feel that, you know, we think that they're resilient. We think our community is resilient, but there is a lot of hurt, pain and stuff. And, and if we can just connect back to nature or, or helping, you know, like, how can we help our community? Can we like do something and drop it off for a neighbor? Like just kind of going back to the basics of how it used to be um, in the old days to just help thy neighbor, right? Help our brothers and sisters. I think that'll help. Thank you all so much for an inspiring session. Uh, we had lots of comments in the chat that stated that you were inspirational. We had so many of our students who um, are from the uh, Latinx community and also from the Pacific Islander community who have not had an opportunity to uh, experience a speaker at Toro University um, and um, from the Pacific, and Island, the Pacific Island communities. And so we really appreciate your participation uh, and we look forward to hearing from you all in the future. Uh, and also we look forward to looking at your uh, future research as well. So thank you all so much for participating and we're gonna close out today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you so, no, thank you all. This was a, a beautiful session. I really appreciate it. We all thank you. It. You all be safe. You too. We got to go teach our class. We'll see you later. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much. It, it was an honor to participate with uh, uh, you, Nani, and Lueni as well. Yes, you as well, Sergio. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so Bye. much.